Hi, my name is Shane Salk, and I'll be talking about audio fiction, audio design, and running a recording studio out. Uh, and that's what I do. Awesome, Shane. Well, hey, man, it's a pleasure to have you here on the show and everything. Um, it's really interesting to know kind of a little bit about what you do and, you know, the, the importance of audio designing within like video games, you know, shows, things like that. I think I actually personally think it's a very important topic to discuss about um, because, you know, you you watch a movie or you you play a video game and all that. And like behind the scenes, like in the back of your head, like all that like sound is going on. And that's what kind of influences you to kind of play that game or, you know, get more into it, like in an emotional level. So, I mean, that's I always thought it was really cool, you know, how the sound design and all that works. But um, just to give anybody just a, who doesn't really know who you are or what you're about, just give them like a quick two, three minutes of what is it that you do, who you are and how you got into it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm Shane. I have been for the last number of years, I've been producing and um, I guess over 10, 15, oh God, a lot of years. Right. I've been uh, producing um, audio series uh, fiction. So this full cast, full sound effects, musical scores, it's much more like a movie cin uh, the way I do the design and my team does the design it's much more cinematic than your normal audio fiction audio podcast or um like audio drama um so that's sort of what I do I got into it because um when I was growing up I actually did I listened to a lot of audio like old time audios on on cassette tapes I think my parents were trying to keep me off of tv and stuff so I, I had these audio tapes of old time shows from the 40s 50s 60s that kind of thing um and I went to school for acting and when I graduated it was very hard to get work not as an actor but just at all as a waiter even um and uh, uh at the time a buddy of mine and I started we created and started producing this uh, show and it started doing very well. This was back in 2009 before podcasting was really a thing. Um, and I really loved how, you know, creating the world, the, the soundscape you, we created these entire worlds out of literal nothing. You don't have visuals to make sound designs off of or anything like that. So um fast forward a little bit that show started doing very well and I start, I made a with my current partner Bill Holmes we did a, a version of a Christmas carol um, and we did it in English and in Spanish um, and it, it even elevated exactly you know sort of how we made those how I made those soundscapes a little bit more with mm -hmm. how you know the people he had with the mixing and the mastering and, and stuff and to create I don't speak Spanish so to create something that everybody could understand in terms of a soundscape right uh without understanding the language was hey, and kind of kind of explain that. i'm kind of curious about that like how yeah. does that work on like designing sound in english and spanish like or how does that really work i mean the sounds are the same you mm -hmm. know if you if you hear a door shut in english or in spanish it's going to be the same sound so that's helpful um but we we designed we recorded all the the voices in English and in Spanish. We had two different casts, amazing actors. I um, mean, the English version we had Maurice Lamarche, Rob Paulson, who were Pinky in the Brain. We had Neil Flynn, who was the janitor on Scrubs, and he was in the middle, like three different Ninja Turtles. Uh, my partner Bill has been in the industry for a long time, so he has a lot of friends. And the Spanish one we had Jojo Hendrickson, um, uh, who was helping us do writing. Who's a writer of. Uh, Ladrone, um, if you know that movie and, and a bunch of other stuff, and uh, Ruben Garfius, who's an incredible actor. But I started designing the English version because I knew English. And then we were able to record the Spanish because it's incredible how it doesn't necessarily matter when you're directing or, um, or anything. You can understand the, the feeling behind the lines in right. any language. Um, we definitely had, you know, all the actors spoke Spanish, obviously, and we had such a diverse amount of backgrounds from, you know, from Mexican to Latina to to Spanish, mm -hmm. uh, from Spain, you know, all of all of these these different, and it and it made this very interesting um, world. Well, it's really cool because like you have different ethnicities, different cultures, and all that, but it's cool how you're like you're in charge of where the mood goes within that sound design, you know, from like telling a story. So like how important, like, I'm kind of curious about that too. Like I never heard it from like somebody who's an audio engineer is how important do you think audio is in like storytelling, whether it's a commercial movie on like moving somebody to drive more attention to what they're watching? 
I think it's it's incredibly important. I mean, you're you're more aware of music and stuff in films or in plays where you're like, oh, the music is setting these moods. Yeah. Um, but for for us, music is is amazing and is definitely needed. And we have an original score in in Carcerum, which is the series that we have right now. But just the soundscape, there is a an entire part of Christmas Carol where there is no talking for about two minutes. There's uh, like maybe a word or two here, but it's not explaining anything. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any music really besides like atmospheric music, meaning like they, the guy walks past a, a band playing and then it kind of fades away. Yeah. It's kind of like, all, a, like a silent film or something like that, right? Kind of like that? Kind of, uh, but silent film would be completely silent. This is more of like you, just the, the pace of the footsteps of him walking through the snow and the the distance of you know uh, a bunch of people singing through a window Christmas carols um, sets and the wind washing wishing wishing all around sets a very creepy mood and it's for about two minutes um, so you can do so much with a sound design that you don't even know and one of the jobs as a sound designer for me is and I think music is similarly but I want you to feel the sound effects and feel the mood, but you don't necessarily need to be made aware that those sound effects are there. Right. I, I do a lot with footsteps in, in all of my shows because I think footsteps are very important. Um, but I don't need you to actually register that you're hearing the footsteps. Your brain goes, oh, they're moving somewhere. They're walking somewhere and they right. have this attitude but you don't have to go, oh, I know these things because of these footsteps. It's kind of like, like a psychological game in a way. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's your subconscious telling you what's happening. And in fact, we have people, because this is sort of a new medium for a lot of people to experience, um, it takes an episode or two to really relax into what is going on. And for me, I find that if you focus really hard on the sound effects and exactly what everything is, you actually lose a lot of the story instead of just sort of letting it happen to you. You turn the lights off and you experience what you experience. It's kind of just like having your eyes shut and just listening to the sound. Yeah. Exactly. If you, you know, if you go to a play and you sort of watch all the lighting changes and the sound cues and like the people's changing and, and you look around and the audience reaction, the lights, you're going to miss things instead of just going, well, this is what I'm watching and let the experience happen to you. Um, sure. And, and this kind of uh, storytelling, I feel, is very, very similar to that. And a lot of it falls on the actors, depending, because, you know, if they're running, we have to believe that they're really running. Yeah. Uh, if, if they're carrying something heavy, they have to carry something heavy mm -hmm. um, instead of just go, oh, well, I'm going to pick up this box and move it right. around. You know, it comes out in the acting and all of these things together, our job is to make it sort of a cohesive experience. So, so that would be a, kind of like my, my next question is like, do you... How, how's your process like when you're creating something like how's your thinking process how's your creation process do you make your own noises like from scratch do you like buy some how, how, does, how does your whole process go so I do have vast amounts of sound libraries sometimes we do do foley which is make your own sound effects yeah uh, once we get the scripts uh or you know once while you're writing the scripts one of my things because sometimes I, I I for this show I have people who you know came on and, and were writers as well as me and that was a huge help. But whenever somebody's writing for this medium, I always tell them to write the movie. Don't write the audio show. Because you have to change a lot less than you think you do. A lot of people, you know, if it's a movie, you're never going to go, well, I'm just going to walk out this blue door and slam it, you know? Yeah. yeah. You don't need to do that in audio. But sometimes people creating this think you do. You think yeah, that's a that's a, obviously a very obvious example. But you have to realize what the audience needs to know and what the audience can come up with themselves. You know, it can be a blue door to me. It could be a green door to somebody else and it doesn't change the story. Right. So write it as a movie with, you know, and I say with all the action, with all the sound, uh, with, with exactly what they're physically doing in the environment, because that will help the actor understand exactly what's happening it'll help us direct them as well to go oh okay so this is what's happening your sword you got to pick up your sword and it's about right. 10 pounds and you got to swing you know you got to make the audience feel that yeah 
Yeah, and and we literally block out everything while we're recording. Um, you know, it can change, uh, you know, things like that as we're recording or in the editing, but the more specific we are every single step of the way, the more clear it's going to be to the audience. So when I'm designing, it's the exact same thing. I'm picturing the movie in my head. I see what the set looks like. I see how the layout of the set is, um, the environment. And then I just start adding those elemental things uh, to the voice. Mm -hmm. And then I go, okay, well, there's a crowd. So I'm adding this crowd with too much of a crowd, too little of a crowd, bigger crowd, smaller crowd. They're walking on, you know, they're walking in, uh, you know, leather boots on a wood floor that's a little bit dirty. Right. And they sit on a creaky stool. Mm-hmm. So all of those things are, I have a very clear picture of what I'm designing. But the most amazing part of it is that as the listener, you do not, my job is not to get you to see exactly what I see. Mm-hmm. If it was, then you'd have to go, oh, I'm going to sit on this brown stool because that's what I see. Right. But it is not to get you to see what I see. It's to get you to see something very clearly. And the more specific I am, the more it allows your brain to make that choice for itself. Mm -hmm. And whatever choice you make, we've had people come up and go, oh, I loved it when they were like running up that hill away from the monster. And I'm sitting here going, I didn't design a hill, but I will definitely take credit for you seeing it because you have no idea that's not what I saw. <laughs> right. No, I, I really find this whole conversation interesting because I, I completely, like, I'm, I'm 100% for it. Like, you know, sound designing, the way that you tell a story through it and like the way people see a film. I always think about it as like, you know, have you heard that term? It's like, you know, a defense wins um, or like an offense wins games and defense wins championships and like that. It's kind of the same uh, way with that. It's kind of like, you know, sound designing is just as an important role as like the director or the writer and all that because you... That's what really makes the whole film become an Emmy or a Grammy award winning thing, type of thing, right? Like an Oscar winning type of thing. Well, and, and one of the things that people, because you're right, it doesn't, it's not something the first thing that comes into people's mind is the sound design because you're, if they do it well in a movie, it looks like it's happening then. But I'll tell you in like a war movie, like Saving Private Ryan or, or something that like that, great movie, but they're not capturing the sound of all of the guns going off at the same right. time and the shells falling out that's somebody after the fact making all of the choices of what these things sound like and the most interesting thing is that sometimes um the sound that you hear is not exactly what you think it is um so for uh, I, I so somebody walking in snow is not actually somebody walking in snow it's going to be sometimes it's uh, uh like baking soda Right. Um, or I've, I've had to design things where I'm like a, a knife coming out of a sheath and, you know, the sound of a knife coming out of a sheath doesn't necessarily paint the picture in my head of a knife coming out of a sheath. So I have to go find something else that does paint that picture, whether it's a, a jacket coming out of a bag or a pen getting the cap taken off. I don't think either one of those sound like a knife. <laughs> <laughs> I understand the point. <laughs> right. Well, I, I'm really interested about that. So like, what's well, kind of been like your most challenging, I guess, sound to make, you know? I was always amazed, like seeing YouTube videos like that of like how people do these. Yeah. I'm like, what was yours in specific? Um, oh man, I can't, I, I honestly, I, the, the two things that come to mind, I had to design for a cartoon pitch once, the sound of an owl flying. Okay. Which is very difficult because most owls don't make sounds when they fly. That's like one of their traits. Mm-hmm. So it's, well, how, what can you do? Fortunately, it was a cartoon. So it was a little bit, I had a little bit more leeway, but how do I make the audience see that something is flying here without actually, uh, you know, making a flapping sound, which would be completely inaccurate. Mm-hmm. Um, we had to do, you know, monster noises are a lot of fun. Um, but you never know what they're act, what you're actually trying to get it to sound like. So that's, that's always, I remember I had to design the sound of somebody getting an IV put in, the, put in their arm. What does that sound like? Yeah. That's exactly what I wondered. Um, but it was, you know, a series of sound effects and I, you know, it had, I, I had a, a bag of liquid and a pen And uh, I don't even remember some of the other stuff, but some of it comes down to the actors making or or taking a sound of an actor 
doing something and then putting that in there and then you go like oh okay i see uh, i had a lot of people um question whether there were two sound effects in the very beginning of of carcerum that people were like you're never gonna be able to do that and i was like calm down <laughs> uh, one was somebody picking up a rock and they're like how nobody's gonna know it's that unless we tell them what's happening and i said that's not true and the other one was a hug those were two things that that uh yeah. that you remember were were worrisome to people because i'm trying to put myself like in your position like let's say i like i was a sound designer i'm like how would i even make those noises like you know because yeah. you also got to go like behind like yeah like how you said like for example the owl like an owl doesn't usually just make the noise like that you know from afar yeah. so it's like okay like you got to learn about how an owl works you know so you got to work how like certain things work exactly exactly and so um those those are the ones that 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 pop into my mind the iv and the hug I remember working on the hug for a very long time and then playing it for people go, do you have any idea what just happened? And they're like, yeah, they're hugging. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like they got it. All right, cool. <laughs> That's awesome, man. And so I always like throwing in this question. I don't know if it, I don't know if it would have affected you in any way, but like the, the whole pandemic part, right? Like for example, musicians weren't able to perform. Like, yeah. Did it affect you in some type of way with like your business or the way, you know, you did stuff? Quite a bit because we're a recording studio. So um, and even when we were recording our own stuff, we would have people come into the studio and, and record. Um, so at the beginning of the pandemic, all everybody stopped letting people come into the studios. Right. Um, you know, commercial clients, everybody was like, nobody can go in because everybody was so worried about, rightfully so, but about liability and keeping everybody safe. Um, and for us, what I did very quickly was figure out how to switch all of our recording to remote. So if somebody had a microphone and a, and a space that was good enough, I could literally engineer them from our studio by hooking into their system. Um, our, our sound mixer uh, master guy, Tim McEwen, uh, we, we met with like once or twice at his house where he had all his setup and we would give him notes on the mix, but we couldn't do that anymore. It was too, too dangerous and and we didn't know what was happening. So I set up a system so we could actually live hear what he was mixing from our studio. So we didn't have to do anything. So it affected a lot. We, we sometimes would record people together. At the beginning, we were testing out things. And then eventually we were like, well, it's actually easier for us to do it one by one, yeah. Um, yeah. put it together. And our job as directors was to go, well, how do we, you know, our job is to make it sound like those two people are in this exact same room that's that's what we did um but uh, you obviously could not have people come in at the same time at all and we switched you know we quickly got a lot of covid protocol quickly as in you know a couple of months we were like okay what are the covid protocols that the city requires that you know the the actors unions require which were all very very good right switched our entire studio to being the safest environment even the unions like really strict on all that stuff too so absolutely as you know again as they should especially when you don't know exactly what's causing everything and what's happening um and and there was was stuff they were trying to implement things for film sets on recording studios and it's very different environments because for a recording studio you have an actor in a room by themselves yeah uh, so we can clean that area and they're not around anybody at all we you know we either bring them in everybody's in masks and everything and we we wipe down everything every single time somebody's in and out of a room um so again it was it was everybody's trying to figure out how to keep everybody the safest and keep everybody working and and it it was a challenge it was right. absolutely because i op we, we opened the studio less than a year before covid hit yeah that's crazy so we're it still and we still are you know in a very you know, building beginning stages of how to run the company in the studio. And then to less than a year later to go, everything you've been working for stops. Yeah. None of your clients can come in. Nobody can pay you anything. And so we're like, well, we have to adapt as quickly as possible. Yeah. And nobody was like, you like knew how to adapt on it. It's like, you exactly. just like figure it out on the spot. Well, and some people were like, oh, this is going to be over in a, in a month or, or a few weeks or two months. Yeah. And so people kept pushing off, trying to figure things out because they thought it would go back to normal. And I guess, fortunately, unfortunately, I mean, fortunately for us, we didn't. Yeah. Um, I was like pretty quickly because we were recording Car Serum. I was like, we need to figure out how to 
do all this remote stuff. We need to figure out exactly how to be able to still work with clients and, and, and stuff. So, you know, almost, you know, within the first month we were like, okay, how do we do this? Yeah. And so, so from like, that kind of brings up this more interesting question is like from when you opened up, like what, what were some of the biggest obstacles? Like when you first got started, like the biggest obstacles you faced, maybe things that you had to, to really learn, like right off the bat that you didn't know, but you had to know. Um, I mean, I had never run a recording studio before, you know, I have a, I have a background in sound design or sound areas, but I was not really a, a sound engineer. And um, there is so much new technology that, and, and the building that we moved into is a great building, but it was built in the seventies or something. So I'm literally running wires through the walls to try to get oh. HDMI into this studio and that studio. Mm -hmm. So every day it was, well, what's the problem we have and how do we fix it? Right. Uh, and it was, it was terrifying. Um, and I'll be honest, it's still terrifying because, you know, if your clients go away, if they, for whatever reason, their company goes under, then our company goes under. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. So that was, that was a big one. And, and constantly trying to come up with other ways to, to work and to, you know, keep the business and going, well, what about this? What about that? We, you know, fortunately, again, for me, my partner has been in the industry for a long time. He taught classes in the back. And so he had a, a background in sort of you know elements of the business and so i came you know i came in and goes well let's do these things to make it so we can do those things you've always wanted to do right and and, and i really love the stories that come out of that that's the reason i asked that question was because a lot of people they always think hey when i'm when i'm starting off i need the most expensive mics most expensive recording systems things like that so it's like you 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 really, you really didn't have that when you first got started did you no, and no. Then you, went to the, you just then like you had an old building you had to run wires it's it's, it's you know yeah. i mean we we um you know, all of us sort of had little bits of different equipment and, and it's good equipment. Yeah. Uh, but I had to learn a lot about different kinds of microphones and because there's tons and tons. And then I have people asking me questions about what they should buy and um, and, and all those things. So, no, I, I would say I learned almost everything I needed to run the studio on YouTube, on 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 reading right. on the uh, on the internet and stuff because again i had no formal training in any of this stuff and and to that point you know when the pandemic hit we were just working on car serum and we were having a really hard time because i was we were very lucky because we bubbled very quickly and the bubble was me my partner bill and his family mm -hmm. so none of us really saw anybody else besides those i live alone so i was able to see them um but it was it was hard as it was for everybody and and we weren't able to get a ppe loan because uh our business wasn't new enough basically or it was too new um it, it we hadn't been around for a year so they're like well we need to see these taxes records and stuff and we didn't have any of that um so we had i had a lot of hard time with that um but about let's see april may a, a couple weeks a couple months in we were going crazy and bill had always wanted to host a game show yeah um and i was like well let's see if we can figure out how to do that so <laughs> we started every week for for months we were we were putting on live game shows on friday uh, friday nights and we had you know everybody you know bill was in the studio i was in the studio and everybody else was on zoom so we had six different panelists two contestants all of this like very silly stuff and you can go back and watch the first ones to the newest ones and see see how it grew so, yeah. but it, it came down to we need to 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 do something for our mental health to not go crazy something that we find fun let's try to do this and then we just try to figure it out and over you know again googling and and yeah. just try to think of the solutions to problems and because of that game show we were actually able to grab a number of other clients who have been uh, instrumental to our survival right? Um, because they either saw the game shows or they contacted us and said, can you do this thing with recording? And because we had done the game shows, I knew how to do this really complex routing thing that I figured out um, again with no training, but it was, well, how do we keep our sanity? And then how do we figure out how to do this thing? Absolutely. And, and you're, you're touching all the key points that I kind of really wanted to really touch on. And yeah. you, you, you painted it perfectly. It's like the whole okay, you're an artist and you know, you got the talent, but how do you run a business? You mentioned that the mental toll that it takes on you. 
like for anybody coming into this, like just just speak a little bit on that, like the whole, you know, the day to day operations, the whole mental toll it takes on you. Um, you know, you talked about the growth of your show from like the first to like the beginning, you know, like that. How did that happen? Like, was there ever a point where like you hit something very critical, maybe a sacrifice that you had to take, but you're glad that you took it? Like, just talk about like the, the business ownership of it and also just like talent, you know, and the mental tolls. It, it's it's really hard and, and it was much worse. And now the reason it's slightly better than it was is because I feel more confident in the fact that things will come along. Even if we're not working a lot this month or this week, yeah. I have the confidence going, well, you know, I, I have the context going, well, that company's slow, but they really liked us. So they're going to come back, that kind of thing. Um, but I mean, the I was living in New York. Mm -hmm. I was working sort of, I was working as a, as a carpenter for, I mean, I was auditioning and, and acting some out there. I was working as a carpenter for events and theaters and doing theater tech. And for the last, you know, over 10 years, I was trying to get the resources to basically produce this series Carcero. Um, and then Bill, I had known for years, and we basically had this opportunity to take over this recording studio. And I moved from New York, where I've been living for five years, very happily, back to nothing to right. run the studio, which I had never done before. And how was that whole transition for you, like, and everything? Horrifying. <laughs> I mean, it, it it could have it could not have gone better in terms of I found a place to live very quickly. I had I had lived here before, so I had some friends around, and the people at the you know who worked with Bill and stuff, everybody was so nice and welcoming, and you know I felt I had to hit the ground running, so. The minute I got here, it was, you know, well, how are we going to make money? What are we going to do? Yeah. Um, and it all, it, 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 every day was terrifying. And it's still, I, I was prepared um, for the mental toll on things. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, I prepared myself going, look, I read a bunch of articles about entrepreneurs and how it affects their mentality and how, you know, the physical and emotional tolls that it takes feeling like you're holding up, you know, all of these other people in this company. And, 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 and something that I always realized years ago was that nobody's necessarily anybody that's not within your company or whatever, isn't going to care as much about what you're doing as you do. Yeah, absolutely. And that's not a, that's not a negative. That's not like trashing anybody there. They shouldn't, you know, you it's can't like, treat an employee like a CEO. Yeah. Right. And it's like you, you know, you care more about your own kids than somebody else's kids. That doesn't mean you don't care about somebody else's kids, but it's just a different feeling. Um, and so keeping people happy and, and listening and, you know, appreciating when they would go out of their way to help was, was a big thing. Um, but I also was like, look, you need to, be constantly do mental check-ins with yourself. Cause I had, I had struggled with depression and anxiety for a, a number of years. So the good thing about that is that I had a baseline that I understood because over the last, you know, seven, five, 10 years or whatever, um, you had learned about yourself and you're like, Oh, I feel bad. What does this feeling mean? And when you first get it, you have no idea, yeah. but it didn't point I can go oh I recognize this feeling this is what it means this is what I maybe have to do to take care of myself this means you're running yourself too ragged and you're going to have a breakdown um so constantly checking in with yourself constantly reminding yourself that you know if it feels like everything's going to shit is it actually going to shit or are your expectations not being met because right. there's a huge difference um you know you put out a product and you, you know, all the data research, all the things you did says you're going to sell uh, a million whatevers. And then you only sell half a million. Does that mean that you deserved, you, you need to have a breakdown? Or does that mean your expectations were too high? Um, that it doesn't necessarily mean you did anything wrong. Has the environment changed? Because the environment changed for us. Yeah, absolutely. Podcasting was totally different by the time, you know, from the first series I did to this, this current one. And then we launched this series um, in September of uh, 2020. So by that point, many, many people had started making podcasts because they had been locked in a room for, for months. So, and a lot of people who had a lot more resources have 
transition their companies to do similar things. So it, I never, never be, it's very hard to, but our show is not, you know, nothing's a failure just because you didn't reach that goal. Right. I mean, it might be very different if you have a fortune 500 company or something, but as a small business, I, yeah, I don't have that training. I don't have that knowledge. So I have to keep reminding myself that, look, the product's good. Your expectations were off, mm -hmm. but the product's good. How can we, you know, advance and what do we have to look at in terms of publicity or the company or whatever, but it doesn't mean you're a failure as a human. <laughs> I think this is the, the better question asking for anybody who's also listening that it might help them out a little bit more is like, what is the term success mean to you? Like, what is success for you? Oh, a lot of people end up getting that mixed up. It's like the money, the fame, this and that. And then sometimes it doesn't happen for them. And they get, you know, like how you said, they get into the pressure, things like that. So it's like, what is success for you? Um, it's a hard one because yeah. I mean, it's, it's stupid, but happiness is, is, really a key is yes, key. i agree i completely agree um but there is a difference also i think between the success of my show mm -hmm. the success of car serum versus the success of me as a person um i think that car serum is a huge success because i'm very proud of it i think if nobody hears it i think it's still one of the best shows out there and i'm not saying that from a, a standpoint of well it's mine and so i love it uh, you know, we, we, we did things with this audio that I didn't even think we could do. I think it pushes the boundaries of, of what people have done and what people have thought is capable. The amount of meetings I sat down with before we do this, trying to get advice or, you know, find investors or something. And the amount of meetings that somebody sat down and goes, why would you do this? Nobody's going to listen to this. Right. I go, well, then it's not me that doesn't get it. It's you that doesn't get it. Right. I have, I have done self check-ins and go, am I ignoring what you're saying? Cause I don't want to hear it. Or do I really believe that, that, that uh, I really believe that you're, you just don't understand it. And you're trying to make me convince you of it. Yeah. I can't do that because it's way harder to convince somebody that's that already thinks it's a bad idea to change their mind and that they were wrong than to explain to somebody why it's a good idea in the first place. Mm. So and, and you should expect those, like those rejections, like, you know, you're never going to get the yes from the way. And like, have you heard that, that, that whole saying of like, you know, when, when Walt Disney was building Disney, like he got denied so many times, you know, Oprah Winfrey, it's like, it, it's going to happen, but stay true to yourself. Stay true to what you really believe in. A yeah. lot of people to change for other people. And it's, it's funny. They're like, yeah, they got 99 no's before the one yes. I'm like, well, yeah. Cause after that one, yes, you don't really need to go talk to people. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. You don't need a lot of people. No, then I don't need to hear any more no's, yeah. but it's also true because you don't really want somebody to go, yeah, here's a million dollars and then come to you constantly going, well, how's it going? It's, you know, I gave this to you because I thought it was going to fail and blah, 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 blah. You want people who are on your side and everybody that invested in anything that, that we did here, um, it, you know, it was not because they really honestly believed in the product or what we were doing to be honest, I don't believe, I think some of them did. I think they thought it was good and they, they, they saw the track record and all the stuff, but they believed in me and my partner and our drive. Yeah. I had numerous people go, you know, you're going to be fine because, you know, we didn't, I didn't invest in, in the product. I invested in the fact that I don't think you're ever going to quit or stop. Yeah. I don't think you're going to give up just because you hit, you know, something something hard well, invest in your drive and your passion your commitment exactly mm -hmm. um and and that's a that's a huge thing and and sometimes it feels like a huge weight because you feel like oh my god they invested in me i can't let everybody down i can't do this but at the same time you also have to remember they invested in me um and they don't want me to crumble so i have to take care of myself and my mental health to be able to take care of my investors and my invest and their investments. Absolutely. Because if I worked 20 hour days for six months, I and everything else is going to just fall apart and you can't let that happen. So you have to realize that you are a resource in yourself. Right. And so the kind of the last three questions I kind of have here is kind of one is you explain the whole situation of 
you know, the, the real, the real things you go through when you're, when you're building something and, you know, you're using your talent as a business, what would, what was your one piece of advice, whether it was somebody that gave to you or you want to give out that's like anybody who's jumping into this industry in the sound design industry or the production or turning their talent into like a, a business, like what would that one piece be? Um, I would say for entertainment industry, and this could be for a lot of different, uh, industries. Um, I've been very screwed over before I've had things stolen from me projects. Uh, my partner has as well. Um, I think that one thing you need to remember is that a contract is only good if you're going to sue somebody over it. And I, and what I mean by that is know who you're going into business with and, and, and trust them and, 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 but listen to yourself, whether you actually trust them or not, because I have contracts saying I'm owed thousands of dollars, but mm -hmm. it will cost me theoretically more money to sue them and get that money than it would to just let it go. Right. Um, so don't ever say, we just got to trust that so-and-so knows what they're doing. We just got to, you know, we're, you know, we got to trust the great thing about a contract and always get a contract because a contract will allow you the moments to go, well, this is what I'm thinking. What are you thinking? And if they go, well, that's never what I was thinking. Then you have a problem and that, you know, up front. they're like, well, you know, we're, you know, we're 50, 50 partners and they go, Oh, well, no, I, I never thought that. But if you get three years down the line and they go, oh, okay, so we, we got a lot of money coming in. Uh, let's, let's make this contract because we need it now. And they go, well, now we have a lot of money coming in. I don't think you've been pulling your weight. And you're like, that's not true or how this works. And, and people's egos get involved. Yeah. Ego is the death of all art, in my opinion. I and, yeah. and, you know, every single art form is a collaboration i don't care what it is unless you write something or paint something or you know make a piece of music that nobody ever hears it's it's a collaboration it may be with the audience but if you paint something and somebody comes up to you and says oh this is what i saw this is what i thought about your painting and you go fuck you that's not it you're you missed the point yeah no they didn't they got something out of it that you maybe didn't intend but you're not living their life with the creative arts, you're always collaborating with, you know, with a, a producer, with a director, with a writer, with the audience, with any of these things. And everybody, uh, somebody told me once a long time ago, they go, look, everybody has a wife, a mother, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, a parent. They all, you know, if somebody comes to you and says, oh, can we change this line to this thing over here? And it doesn't matter to you. And you're like, okay, that's, you know, I have no ego about that. Change that line. That's fine. That's somebody who can point to that line when it comes up in your movie or whatever and go, that was me, that was me. And they can tell all their friends that that was their line. That's a thing. You're always collaborating with people, with egos, with these things. Um, and I think that's, that's important to remember that other people are people too. And theoretically, yeah. you know, everybody's trying to do their best to survive. And that doesn't mean in business. That just means in life, you know, and anybody that screws you over, that was their survival instincts kicking in. It has nothing necessarily to do with you personally. They can't do anything to you personally. It's them doing something that they feel they have to do. Yeah. Whether it's to hold power over somebody or, or whatever, it's, it's, it's tough. So that's why you really need to know who you're going into business with regardless talk to them at the beginning have that contract so you all know you're on the same page so if somebody goes yeah i'm not doing that contract anymore everybody knows you're screwing them over and you're like okay so this is where we're at yeah absolutely i completely agree contracts are extremely important the last two questions is what is what is curse what is it car, car, serum? car serum i always remember it the whole time and then like right now when i was about to mention it, i was like oh i completely went blank <laughs> a serum of a car c-a-r-c-e-r-e-m so what is all that about like just tell us the whole general so it? it's uh, Car Serum. We have the first season out right now. It's 32 episodes of a high fantasy uh, audio series. So it's full cast, about 120 characters or actors in the first season, cinematic sound design. It's really an immersive experience. Um, uh, it's, it's like Game of Thrones or Lord of the Ring meets Princess Bride. It's funny. It makes you cry. It has monsters. It has heart. Um, 
and uh, original scoring. And we've won a, a, a bunch of awards um, internationally uh, off this thing, but it's, it's free. It's a podcast. So um, Jane Lynch is in it. Neil Flynn, who's a janitor on Scrubs. Uh, Piper Laurie. Um, tons and tons more. You can go on, on the website and see, see the whole cast. But um, it's, it's, uh, it's incredible. Yeah, that, 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 is, that sounds really awesome. Yeah. yeah, over 10 hours of story in this first season, and we're working on season two. That is awesome, man. That is awesome. I'll definitely go ahead and check it out. And what, what's that? I should have thrown this question in before, but I guess now I'm going to throw it in now. It's like, what's that one thing you wish you knew now that you wish you would have known when you first got started? It's like we're just jumping back and forth with emotions right now. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, you, people always tell you that it's going to take longer than you think it is, and you mm -hmm. never really believe it. Um, that's one of it. Uh, again, the, the talk to people and, and have your deals up front is very important. Know who you're going into business with. Um, and it's so hard. And the reason it's hard is because you hear so many of these things before you start. And so it's not like you haven't heard, take care of yourself. It's not like you haven't heard, know who you're going into business with. It's not like you haven't heard, uh, you know, be nice to yourself. Right. Um, but you always kind of throw it aside as, well, I'm going to have a different experience. Right. Um, but all of the, that I think my whole life. So from an early age, I sort of had to get good at asking for help. And, but when I got to making my company, I was good at asking for help, but I didn't see it as asking for help. It was finding the resources that I didn't already have. Mm -hmm. And don't think you have to know everything and do Google searches for, for, um, like mentors. Yeah. Reach out to all of the people that you know, and don't be afraid to reach out to somebody you don't know just to ask for help. The worst is they don't respond. Yeah, absolutely. And that's not a failure. If you go to a meeting, this is, this is a, this is it. I'll, I'll say this is it. Yeah. This is one of the philosophies that's gotten me really far. If I go to a meeting and I'm hoping for money or hoping for contacts or anything, but if I go to a meeting and I leave there with the only thing that I've gained is an ally and somebody who at least doesn't want me to fail, that's a successful meeting. It, yeah. I don't have to walk out with something tangible. I don't have to walk out with something that leads me to the next step. That's very nice, but it's still a successful meeting if I walk out of there with somebody going, you know what, you know, I can't help you at all, but I really hope this works. Right. If I walk out of there when somebody goes, fuck you. I, I hope, you know, yeah. I've got into a big argument or something like that. I'm like, that's a it's kind of a failure of a meeting. Yeah. It just, it's taken me emotionally backwards. So that's, that's, that's my, that's my big takeaaway from a lot of it. And opportunities everywhere, man. Like it, it, I was tired, but like, it just takes one opportunity that you took. That's going to change everything for you. But if you don't take it and you don't, you don't do anything about it, it's never going to happen. And I have 100%. And the reason I say all that thing is about the allies, 100%. I've had a meeting with somebody, you know, like four years ago mm -hmm. and nothing came of it, but they were very nice and we were very friendly. We became friends or something. And then three or four years later, they were crucial, essential into helping me get to a next step. Um, that's, that's why. You never know where it's going to come from. That person might even tweet something and go, hey, I met with this guy, you know, take a yeah. look. And that tweet is seen by somebody. There's no reason to burn. It's not even burn bridges. There's no reason not to be kind to people. There's no reason not to be angry because you didn't get exactly what you wanted. You walk out of there with a friend or again, just an ally or, or somebody who hopes you the greatest success. Absolutely. You never know when that's going to come back into play and you're going to be crashing on their couch when you live out and, you know, you're trying to move out to LA. Absolutely, man. You just never know who you're going to meet. And so just where can people find you, Shane? Where can people listen, listen to your stuff or check out your stuff? Things like that. 
Uh, you can find the show at carcerumtheseries.com. That's C-A-R-C-E-R-E-M, theseries.com. You can find all, or you can search for it on any pl- podcasting platform. There's also a contact me page. You can find us on social media at at Carcerum the series on pretty much everything. Um, or you can just find me on Facebook with just Shane Salk. Awesome. Well, appreciate you so much, man, for taking out the time of the day, you know, just to be on here on a Sunday. Um, it's also a football Sunday. I don't know if you watch football, but. <laughs> uh, my, my team's all got out a while ago. Yeah, not mine too. So I don't really care as much anymore. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, no, man, I really appreciate you for being on here, taking the time out of your day. And, you know, I hope this inspires a lot of people, anybody listening and anybody who's subscribed and everything to just get something out of this and, and go pursue what they want to do. So I appreciate you, man. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you.